Good day, dear all. I hope your day is going well so far. So for my first talk with you all, today I'm going to be sharing with you about portal hypertension and liver cirrhosis. Both are subspecialities under gastroenterology. So firstly, I will discuss with you the etiology of the conditions, the causes of portal hypertension and liver cirrhosis. Next, I will share with you the clinical presentations or manifestations of the conditions. Then I'll go on to recommend the appropriate management, which are both surgical and using pharmacotherapy. I will end with a list of complications that could possibly arise in the future and therefore are important to monitor. As a brief introduction, we will be looking into causes of both portal hypertension and cirrhosis and you will then understand the origins or contributing factors to the conditions, although we won't go too much into details with that. Then you will learn about the different parts of the liver in which the problems lie and therefore the challenges they cause. The handout where the liver anatomy is illustrated will be handy for that reason. Many of the problems will present themselves clinically and you will learn about their signs and symptoms and the diagnostic procedures that help to determine the conditions. Due to the complications and pressure gradient, which only grows over time with bottle hypertension and the worsening liver conditions leading to cirrhosis, drugs like beta blocker alone will not suffice. The most common cause of portal hypertension is cirrhosis. Cirrhosis is often the result of alcohol abuse or hepatitis B or C infections, as well as other alcoholic liver diseases. Portal hypertension is characterized by a pathologic increase in portal venous pressure that leads to the formation of an extensive network of portosystemic collaterals that divert a large fraction of portal blood into the systemic circulation bypassing the liver. According to the anatomic location of the obstacle to blood flow, the causes of portal hypertension can be classified as prehepatic, which involves the splenic, mesenteric or portal vein, intrahepatic, caused by liver diseases, and post-hepatic, caused by diseases which block the hepatic venous outflow. You may want to refer to the handouts for the illustration of the liver anatomy to understand the surrounding tributaries of blood vessel system and therefore to help you understand how portal venous pressure leads to the formation of an extensive network of portosystemic collaterals. The normal liver has the ability to accommodate large changes in portal blood flow without appreciable alterations in portal pressure. Portal hypertension, on the other hand, results from a combination of increased portal venous inflow and increased resistance to portal blood flow. Patients with cirrhosis demonstrate increased splenic arterial flow and accordingly increased splenic venous inflow into the liver. The portal hypertension of cirrhosis is caused by the disruption of hepatic sinusoids. However, portal hypertension may be observed in a variety of non-cirrhotic conditions. Cirrhosis represents the final common histologic pathway for a wide variety of chronic liver diseases. The term cirrhosis was first introduced by Lennox in 1826. 
It is derived from the Greek term cirrus and refers to the orange, brown or tawny surface of the liver seen at autopsy. Cirrhosis is defined histologically as a diffuse hepatic process characterized by fibrosis and the conversion of normal liver architecture into structurally abnormal nodules. The progression of liver injury to cirrhosis may occur over weeks to years. Indeed, patients with hepatitis C may have chronic hepatitis for as long as 40 years before progressing to cirrhosis. The portal pressure can be measured directly using a transjugular approach to the portal vein via the hepatic veins or by direct puncture of the portal vein through a percutaneous transhepatic route under ultrasound guidance. A catheter is then passed over a guide wire into the main portal vein. Measurements are taken by inflating and deflating the balloon in the tip of the catheter. Some patients with cirrhosis are completely asymptomatic and have a reasonably normal life expectancy. Others have a multitude of the most severe symptoms of end-stage liver disease and a limited chance for survival. Common problems that stem from decreased hepatic synthetic function, for example, coagulopathy, portal hypertension, for example, variceal bleeding, or decreased detoxification capabilities of the liver, for example, encephalopathy. Usually, doctors make the diagnosis of portal hypertension based on the presence of ascites or of dilated veins or varices as seen during a physical exam of the abdomen or the anus. Various lab tests, X-ray tests, and endoscopic exams may also be used in addition to ultrasonography and Doppler ultrasonography that measure sound waves. MR angiography MRA, uses a powerful magnetic field, radio waves, and a computer to evaluate blood vessels and help identify abnormalities. This exam does not use radiation and may require an injection of contrast material. The contrast material used for MRA is less likely to cause an allergic reaction than the contrast material used for computer tomography. Cirrhosis can be diagnosed by radiology testing such as computer tomography, ultrasound or magnetic resonance imaging MRI or via a needle biopsy of the liver. A new imaging technique called elastography, which can be performed with ultrasound or MRI, can also diagnose cirrhosis. Many patients with cirrhosis experience fatigue, anorexia, weight loss, and muscle wasting. Cutaneous manifestations of cirrhosis include jaundice, spider angiomata, skin telangiectasia, palmar arrhythmia, white nails, disappearance of lunulae, and finger clubbing, especially in the setting of hepatopulmonary syndrome. Cirrhosis can also lead to multi-organ dysfunctions. It induces portal hypertension, hepatorenal syndrome, hepatic encephalopathy, and can possibly cause hepatocellular carcinoma. When a patient develops portal hypertension, in addition to the physical signs and symptoms here, they may start to notice blood in the stools, which is a sign of GI bleeding. The patient may notice blood in the stool or may even vomit blood if any large vessels around the stomach that was developed due to portal hypertension ruptures. When fluid accumulates in the abdomen, it causes swelling. 
in addition, encephalopathy or confusion and fogginess in the thinking can also occur. Jaundice, the yellowing of the skin and the whites of the eyes, also develop over time. Edema, in particular swelling of the legs, are also noticeable. Caput medusa, a visible network of dilated veins surrounding the navel, will also become apparent. Several changes also occur within the physiological system, as listed here. This is a typical presentation of an underlying portal hypertension condition. To determine causes of portal hypertension involves obtaining information on the history of jaundice, history of blood transfusion, or administration of various blood products or intravenous drug use. Thirdly, a history of sketosomiasis in childhood may also be necessary in order to determine if the infection was endemic. Fourthly, a history of other hepatic related diseases are also necessary. Good carry syndrome, a post hepatic cause, is characterized by hepatomegaly, abdominal pain, and ascites. Ascites is suggested by the following findings on physical examination abdominal distension, bulging flanks. Shifting dullness, elicitation of a puddle sign in patients in the knee elbow position. Hepatic encephalopathy can range from mild to severe. And a state of severe may be observed in as many as 70% of patients with cirrhosis. Grade 0 is subclinical, where the patient's mental status is normal, but there is a minimal change in memory, concentration, intellectual function, and coordination. At grade 1, the patient is mildly confused, shows euphoria, or is depressed, has decreased attention, slowing of ability to perform mental tasks, irritability, disorder of sleep pattern. At grade 2, patient exhibits drowsiness, lethargy, gross deficits, inability to perform mental tasks, obvious personality changes, inappropriate behavior, and intermittent disorientation. Grade 3 is where the patient exhibits worsening symptoms and shows somnolence, inability to perform mental tasks, Disorientation with regard to time and place, marked confusion, occasional fits of rage, and speech is present but incomprehensible. At grade 4, patient may be in a coma with or without response to painful stimuli. To confirm an acute variceal bleed, Firstly, an endoscopy is performed. Next, hemodynamic monitoring is done. Fresh frozen plasma, vitamin K and platelet transfusion, if necessary, is given to prevent further worsening of coagulation. Hepatic encephalopathy is prevented by giving lactulose. Therapeutic options available are vasoactive drugs, endoscopic sclerotherapy, variceal banding, sanctacan black mold tube, or tips. Vasoactive drugs that lower portal venous pressure are key in the management of acute variceal bleed. For example, 
vasopressin and telepressin both lower portal venous pressure by constriction of splenic arterioles. Somatostatin, in addition to constriction of splenic arterioles, inhibits splenic vasodilatory peptides like glucagon. Thirdly, octreotide can be given. The combination of immediate use of a vasoactive drug and endoscopic banding ligation or sclerotherapy is the therapeutic gold standard for acute treatment of bleeding viruses. A very common approach is to perform a procedure where an expandable metal stent is inserted between portal vein and hepatic vein producing an intrahepatic portosystemic shunt. This approach is taken through internal jugular vein and is also known as TIPS. The child pew scoring provides a forecast of the increasing severity of a patient's liver disease and the expected survival rate. It is also referred to as the child pew classification the child turcot pew calculator and the child criteria. Based on the scoring, the pathway for management of aerial bleed is determined. For the secondary prevention of aerial bleeding, beta blockers are used. Propanolol or nadolol is effective in reducing portal venous pressure. Administration of these drugs at doses that reduce the heart rate by 25% has been shown to be effective in the primary prevention of variceal bleeding and also for secondary prevention. For the management of complications, for example, for hepatic encephalopathy, pharmacologic treatment includes the administration of lactulose and antibiotics. For ascites, the treatment can include sodium restriction and the use of diuretics, large volume paracentesis and shunts, peritovenous portosystemic transjugular intrahepatic portosystemic are used. For severe conditions, liver transplantation may be necessary. Patients should be referred for consideration for liver transplantation after the first signs of hepatic decompensation. Portal hypertension means increased blood pressure in portal hepatic system. Most commonly, this happens because of hepatic cirrhosis when the liver tissue is replaced by fibrotic functionless tissue. Now the portal venous system comprises the portal vein and its tributaries, namely the splenic and mesenteric veins. Blood contains all the nutrients that the GI tract can absorb, but it also carries the toxins that the liver metabolizes so that they can be safely excreted by the kidneys. Now there are a few points within the boundaries of the hepatic portal system where it could be connected to the systemic venous system which collects blood and sends it to the rest of the body. The inferior portion of the esophagus, for example. But in some situations, an obstruction may prevent blood flow from the portal vein towards the inferior vena cava. When this happens, venous blood accumulates in the hepatic portal system, causing pressure to rise above 12 mm mercury, which defines portal hypertension. Portal hypertension leads to the formation of portal systemic shunts, which is when blood is diverted away from the portal venous system and backs up into the systemic veins. So first, less blood gets to the liver, causing diminished liver function and decreased blood detoxification which leads to a build-up 
of toxins, which leads to a buildup of toxic metabolites like ammonia in the blood. Ammonia and other toxins can pass through the blood-brain barrier and cause hepatic encephalopathy. Second, blood backing up in the systemic veins leads to portal systemic shunts, which happens in the three points where the systemic venous system and the hepatic portal system are connected. The point of connection is the esophagus. This causes esophageal varices or enlarged esophageal veins. In fact, portal hypertension is the most common cause of esophageal varices. These varices are very fragile and could easily rupture, causing massive upper GI bleeding. In the rectum and anal canal, there may be hemorrhoids, which are enlarged veins that can bleed as well. Finally, portal hypertension causes the round ligament to allow blood from the portal system to pass into the systemic veins of the abdomen, which then dilates, making the abdomen look like the head of a great mythological creature, Medusa. Portal hypertension can also cause blood to back up into the spleen, causing congestive spinomegaly, meaning the enlarged spleen. This causes hypersplenism. Now, the causes of portal hypertension can be classified as prehepatic, interhepatic, or posthepatic, depending on where the obstruction is. The most common prehepatic cause is portal vein obstruction, like where there's a thrombus, occluding the portal vein and blocking blood flow. Intrahepatic causes include cirrhosis, schytosomasis, which is when the flatworms invade the liver, and sarcoidosis, which is when inflammatory cells from lumps called granuloma occurs inside the liver. Another consequence of portal hypertension is that the endothelial cells lining the blood vessels Lining the blood vessels release more nitric oxide. The reason behind this is unclear, but nitric oxide makes peripheral arteries dilate so blood pressure drops. This stimulates the release of aldosterone, which tries to bring blood pressure back up by telling the kidneys to retain more sodium and water. In time, plasma volume expands so much that fluid and blood vessels is more likely to get pushed into tissues and across tissues into large open spaces like the peritoneal cavity. The accumulation of fluid in the peritoneal cavity is called ascites. Bacteria can also invade the peritoneal cavity, causing spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. The features of portal hypertension can be remembered as A, B, C, D, E, where A stands for ascites, B for bleeding. C for caput medusa, D for diminished liver function, and E for enlarged spleen. Now, causes of portal hypertension can be classified as prehepatic, interhepatic, or posthepatic, depending on where the obstruction is. The most common prehepatic cause is portal vein obstruction, like when there is a thrombus. Intrahepatic causes include cirrhosis and schytosomiasis. Cirrhosis is by far the most common of the three post-hepatic causes, including right-sided heart failure, constrictive pericarditis, and Butte-Curry syndrome. Both right-sided heart failure and constrictive pericarditis restrict the blood flow from the heart to the lungs and to the rest of the body, causing blood to accumulate downwards including into the portal circulation, and Butte-Curry syndrome occurs when a thrombus or tumour inside the hepatic veins that obstruct hepatic vena flow towards the inferior vena cava happens. Portal hypertension may be asymptomatic until complications occur. <coughs> Visible signs include a distended abdomen with ascites and caput medusa, or visibly engorged superficial abdominal veins. GI bleeding secondary to esophageal varices can present with hematemesis or vomiting blood or melina, 
where there's blood in the stool. With liver impairment, jaundice may occur and finally with hepatic encephalopathy, there may be hand tremors whenever the wrist is extended. Altered consciousness, lethargy, seizure or coma, coma may also occur. The gold standard for determining if there is portal hypertension is obtaining a hepatic venous pressure gradient measurement where catheter is inserted inside the interior vena cava and then inside the portal vein to measure the difference between both pressures. A liver ultrasound might be useful de to detect nodules in case of cirrhosis. CD scan or MRI help diagnose a cirrhosis, spenomegaly or vascular alterations like like in the case of cirrhosis. Full blood count, liver enzymes and serology can also be useful to identify the cause and an upper GI endoscopy can identify esophageal varices in order to treat them appropriately. Treatment is centered on prevention and treatment of complications. Beta blockers like propanolol can decrease portal venous pressure and prevent complications. For ascites, diuretics and sodium restrictions are indicated to reduce the fluid overload. If esophageal varices bleed, a medication called ectratide and procedures like balloon tamponade or sclerotherapy and variceal ligation can be used to prevent bleeding from happening again. An interventional radiology technique called TIPS is the preferred procedure to decrease hepatic portal pressure and prevent further complications. TIPS is actually a transjugular intrahepatic portosystemic shunt where a tube is inserted via a catheter to allow communication between the portal vein and hepatic vein. Finally, thank you for watching and listening. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them. Do hit the subscribe and bell buttons so you get notifications when my next video is up. Thank you.